1. The Diamond A spiritual man visited and told Al Horford, If you had a diamond as big as your thumb, you could buy all the land around here. With a diamond mine and the wealth it brings, you could even make your child a king. Thinking of the diamond's value, he couldn't sleep all night. The next morning, he urgently asked the spiritual man to show him where to find diamonds, who said, Look for a stream that flows from a very tall mountain. The diamond lies among the sand in that stream's bed. So Al Horford sold all his property, determined to find this treasure. He searched and searched but found nothing, eventually dying on the coast of Spain. The new owner of Horford's house one day found a sparkling object in the sand of a small stream in the backyard. He dug it out, took it home, and placed it on the kitchen shelf. When the spiritual man visited again, he noticed the shining stone on the shelf and said, This is the diamond. Has Al Horford returned? No, Al Horford hasn't come back yet. I found this stone in the backyard, replied the homeowner. 2. The Light of Dawn The rabbi spoke to his disciples, saying, Do you know when the night ends and the day begins? The disciples responded, Is it when one can distinguish between a goat and a dog from afar, signaling the arrival of day? That's not correct, the rabbi replied. Then what is the correct sign, the disciples inquired. It's when we can clearly see the face of another person, meaning when you can still recognize your brothers and sisters. Because if the disciples cannot see these things, no matter the time, it is still night. 3. The Divine Insult There lived a great theologian who led a solitary life. One day, God sent an angel to wake him. The angel said, your prayers have been answered by God. All your wishes will be granted. Just tell me what you desire, and I will make it happen. The theologian, looking disheartened, replied, I wish you had come earlier when I had many desires. But now, I've come to accept myself as I am, living contentedly. I'm indifferent to whether God exists or not. I don't seek His favors. I used to pray because it felt right, but now... I no longer ponder on such matters. I'm satisfied with what I have. You're too late, but please extend my thanks to God. The angel responded, This is an affront to the divine. God has offered you a wish, and you must make one. The theologian felt troubled and said with a shrug, What should I wish for then? Can you advise me? I have everything I need and am quite content. My life is wonderful, flawless, filled with joy and happiness. Perhaps you can tell God how grateful I am for His help. However, the angel insisted, No, you must wish for something. It's a matter of courtesy, do you understand? With no other choice, the theologian finally said, If you insist, then please tell God to maintain my life as it is. Just grant me the continuance of what I already possess. 4. Just Like the Lion In a certain circus, there was a woman who was an excellent lion tamer. She had all the fierce lions under her control, following her every command. She even devised several dangerous acts that left the audience breathless, such as placing a piece of candy on her tongue for the lion to lick off after receiving her command. The crowd was always thrilled, showering her with applause and praise. One day, Nasaluding was among the audience. While everyone else was full of compliments, he arrogantly remarked, What's so great about that? Anyone could do it. The woman looked at him disdainfully and challenged, Can you do it? He replied, Of course, anyone could, just like that lion. 5. The Millionth Stone after a long time spent searching for precious stones by the riverbank, exhausted and worn out, a man sat on a protruding rock near the water's edge, speaking to his friend beside him. Look, I've picked up 999,999 stones and still haven't found a single gem. I give up. His friend joked, Why not try just one more stone, 
to make it an even million. Reluctantly, the stone seeker reached out for one more stone, and to his surprise, he felt it was heavier than usual. Upon closer inspection, he exclaimed in astonishment, a gemstone. Six, happiness in a glass of water. A poor man and a wealthy man were debating what constitutes happiness. The poor man said, happiness is in the present moment. The wealthy man, looking disdainfully at the poor man's thatched roof and tattered clothes, retorted, how can this be happiness? My happiness lies in owning a hundred houses and having a thousand servants. A massive fire later engulfed all of the wealthy man's properties, destroying his wealth and causing his servants to flee. Overnight, the wealthy man became a beggar. In the scorching heat of July, drenched in sweat, the former wealthy man stumbled to the poor man's humble dwelling, pleading for a sip of water. The poor man offered him a cool glass of water and asked, Now, what do you think happiness is? With eyes filled with longing and anticipation, the beggar replied, Happiness was the glass of water he was holding at that moment. 7. Three Examples Tan Bin Kong spoke to the great minister Su Kong. I am now 70 years old and always feel that my knowledge is not sufficient. Although I enjoy reading books and learning from the sages at my age, it seems too late to learn anything new. Too late, Su Kuang replied. If it's late, then light a candle. I am being serious here, but you seem to be jesting, said Tan Bin Kong. Su Kuang responded, As a servant, how dare I jest with the king? What I mean to say is that if a person studies well in their youth, their future will be bright as the morning sun. If they study well in their middle age, it's like the sun at noon. And in old age, even if it's just like the light of a candle, that light is still brighter than darkness. 8. Repaying Harm with Kindness Once, a deer was wandering through the forest when it suddenly heard cries for help. Rushing towards the source of the noise, the deer found a wolf trapped under a fallen tree. The deer asked, Hey wolf, are you all right? Stop asking and just use your antlers to lift this tree off me so I can get out, the wolf said. I'm not sure if I can lift it, the deer replied. Nevertheless, the deer tried, and after exerting a great deal of effort, managed to lift the tree enough for the wolf to escape. The first thing the wolf did was check for broken bones, and then, happily jumping around, said to the deer, Deer, now I want to eat you. What? The deer exclaimed in shock, saying, Don't you feel any shame? I just saved your life, and now you want to eat me. True, you saved my life, and I'm thankful for that. But I'm hungry now, so I need to eat you. They argued for a while before deciding to ask a bear to settle their dispute. They recounted the entire story in detail to the bear. After thinking for a moment, the bear said to the deer, You saved the wolf, and now the wolf wants to eat you, which is not right. However, from another perspective, the wolf has a point, being hungry and thus needing to eat you. Let's do this. Take me to where the tree fell and show me how you saved the wolf. Then I can decide. Both the deer and the wolf agreed, and they all returned to the location of the fallen tree. The deer, once again, used all its strength to lift the tree, but this time placed it back on the wolf. Then the bear said, Use your antlers to lift the tree and save the wolf again. The deer replied, I've already lifted this tree twice today. I'm too tired now. The bear said, If you don't have the strength to lift it, then don't. But how am I supposed to solve this situation? Dear, don't be upset. It's not that I don't support you, but I'm out of options. After saying this, the bear walked away. Truly out of options. After saying this, the deer also left, leaving the wolf trapped under the tree until it died. Life is full of debts of gratitude and revenge with some choosing to repay kindness with kindness and harm with harm, becoming a life philosophy for many. Whether it's gratitude or revenge, 
we should be thankful for life itself and for those who help us in times of need. 9. The Human Skull On his visit to the state of So, Zhuangzi came across a human skull in the wild grass by the roadside, from which a whistling sound emerged as the wind passed through. Zhuangzi, striking it with a leather whip, inquired of it, Did you engage in heinous deeds that led to this fate? Were you a victim of war, your body mutilated by an enemy? Did you commit acts so vile that they brought shame and despair upon your family, leading to this end? Were you overcome by hunger, cold, and deprivation? Or did you simply reach the end of your natural life and die of old age? After speaking, Zhuangzi, feeling tired, laid down on the grass, using the skull as a pillow, and fell asleep. At midnight, the skull appeared in his dream. I heard what you said during the day. You are indeed eloquent. You spoke of loss, humiliation, hunger, and aging all afflictions of the living. Death frees one from these. Would you like to know the joy that comes after death? Zhuangzi replied, Yes, please share. The skull said, In death there are no rulers to obey, no seasonal labors. You exist in a state of freedom, eternal as the earth and sky, a joy not even kings can compare with. Zhuangzi, skeptical, offered, what if I called upon the deity of life and death to revive you? Return to your family, your spouse and children, your friends. Would you want that? No, 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 the skull exclaimed in terror. I cherish this freedom, this peace. I dread the toil and strife of the mortal world. 10. A Fable Fishermen cast their nets into the deep sea and pulled up a jar, within which was a piece of paper that read, Everyone, please come save me, I am here. The Dragon King has imprisoned me on a deserted island. I am standing on the shore waiting for rescue. Please, someone save me, I am here. No date mentioned. It's probably too late now. The jar must have been adrift at sea for quite some time, one fisherman said. The location is unclear with the vast ocean who knows which direction to search, another fisherman remarked. It's never too late, nor is it far. Every island is essentially here, a third person commented. Thus, they felt unbound and thus they pondered. The usual truth is just like that. 11. Crabs and herons fight, fishermen reaps the benefits. By the river bank, a large crab opened its shell, stretching its tired back, and basked in the sunlight. A heron, spotting this, pecked at the crab's flesh. The crab quickly closed its shell, trapping the heron's beak inside. The heron struggled frantically, but couldn't escape. Without rain today or tomorrow, you'll die of thirst, the crab declared. With its beak trapped, the heron's response was unclear. The crab retorted, If I don't release you today or tomorrow, you'll starve to death. Both stared each other down, neither willing to back down. In the end, a fisherman came along and captured both of them. 12. The most important thing. A king wished for his people to always live in peace, believing that if three key tasks were properly managed, the nation would thrive. First, to predict the most crucial time, second, to identify the most important person, and third, to carry out the best action. His advisors suggested managing schedules effectively, focusing on educating clergy and scientists, and promoting science while strictly enforcing laws as top priorities. The king sought advice from a hermit who did not respond directly. While helping the hermit with his labor, they encountered a wounded man at dusk. The king assisted in treating the man's injuries before returning to the palace. The next day, the healed man, previously the king's enemy, thanked him and expressed a desire to become friends, having abandoned his plans for revenge due to the king's kindness.
Inquiring again about his three questions, the hermit explained that the king's actions had already answered them. The most critical time is now, the most important person is the one you are with, and the most crucial task is to love. Without love, life lacks meaning. 13. The Spiritual Leader In a serene garden, a highly respected spiritual leader was deeply immersed in prayer. At that moment, a distressed woman, frantic with worry, rushed through the garden searching for her lost child. In her anxious state, she failed to notice the spiritual leader kneeling in prayer and accidentally collided with him. Without offering an apology, she hurriedly continued her search. The spiritual leader, visibly irritated and stomping his foot, felt a surge of anger. However, by the time he finished his prayers, the woman had joyfully found her child and ran back towards him. Upon seeing the spiritual leader's angered face, she was both shocked and startled. The spiritual leader, still irked, demanded, Can you explain your actions just now? The woman replied, I'm so sorry, spiritual leader. I was so consumed with worry for my child's safety that I didn't see you there. But weren't you in the middle of prayer? Surely the being you were appealing to values my child's life far more than I do. Why then did you let my actions disturb you? At this, the spiritual leader was left speechless, his head bowed in reflection. 14. Conversations with God A disabled person ascended to heaven in search of God, lamenting that God hadn't granted him healthy limbs. God introduced him to a newly deceased person who had just entered heaven. This person told the disabled man, Appreciate what you have, at least you're still alive. A disgruntled official came to heaven to complain to God about not receiving ample rewards and fortune. God introduced him to the disabled person who told the official, Appreciate what you have, at least you're healthy. A young man arrived in heaven to criticize God for not making him respected by others. God introduced him to the disgruntled official who told the young man, Appreciate what you have, at least you're still young. Speaking with God, in reality, means hearing the sound of one's own voice. 15. The Gardener of God A farmer diligently worked his barren, rocky land every day, watering and tilling the soil. Through hard work and perseverance, he transformed the desolate plot into a lush garden. He felt proud and joyful. One Sunday morning, on his way to the garden, he encountered an official and invited him to see his garden. The official agreed. Entering the melon patch and seeing the ripe, juicy melons, the official remarked, Oh, God must have blessed this land. Upon seeing the rice field heavy with grain, he commented, My, God has truly blessed these rice crops. And then added, Goodness, you and God have achieved great things with this land. The farmer, unable to contain himself, replied, With all due respect, I wish you could have seen this place when God was managing it on his own. 16. Which foot first? Philosopher Frog was intensely observing Centipede walk with its hundreds of legs, curiously wondering, Walking with four legs is challenging enough. How does Centipede manage with so many? The more Frog thought about it, the more perplexed he became. How does Centipede decide which foot to move first, then the next, and so on, especially with hundreds to choose from? So, he stopped Centipede to inquire. I'm a philosopher and there's a puzzle I can't solve. Perhaps you can help. With so many legs, how do you know which to move first and which follows? Moving all those legs in coordination seems unbelievable. Centipede responded, I've always just walked this way. No one has ever questioned me about it before. Now that you ask, let me think it over and get back to you. This was the first time Centipede had ever considered this question. It paused for a moment, motionless, then stumbled and finally collapsed, saying to Frog, Maybe you should ask another Centipede. I've always walked without any issues. 
As for which foot goes first, I've racked my brain and still can't figure it out. Now I can't move at all. All my legs want to go at once. What should I do? 17. Fire. In a workshop, various tools were discussing how to handle a piece of tough metal. The axe, boasting of its strength, declared, Let me handle this. I'll take care of it quickly. So it swung at the metal but soon became dull and chipped while the metal remained unscathed. Let me try, the saw said eagerly biting at it with its teeth, only to end up with broken teeth and a blunted edge. Then the hammer laughed and said, You guys are useless. Step aside and let me do it. But after a series of loud, ear-splitting strikes, the hammer too was damaged and the metal was still unaffected. Can I give it a try? A small flame nearby spoke up. It was ignored by the others, but still, it approached the metal. Gently, the flame warmed, steadily increasing the heat. As time passed, under the flame's persistent heat, the metal began to glow red and eventually melted away. 18. Where to go? A student of a certain philosopher was always curious about everything he saw, constantly questioning or inquiring about various things. One day, noticing his teacher appeared weary, the student said, Master, I know your time in this world is limited, but before you leave this physical form, may I ask one question? Otherwise, it will trouble me for life. The teacher, puzzled, made an effort to open his eyes and look at his student, asking, What is it? The student asked, After you pass to the other side, where will you go? The teacher replied, Why would I need to go anywhere else? After saying this, the teacher closed his eyes and passed away. Not needing to go anywhere else? The student repeated, dissatisfied with the teacher's answer. In fact, the wise teacher had given a profoundly subtle response, but understanding it required a high level of spiritual insight. Not needing to go anywhere else implies that the wise teacher had already been everywhere in a sense and no longer needed to travel anywhere. 19. Teeth gone, tongue remains. Lao Tzu's mentor, Chang Tung, was profoundly learned and had unique approaches to problem-solving. One day, Lao Don visited his ailing teacher. Chang Tung opened his mouth to show Lao Don and then asked, Do you see any teeth left in my mouth? No, master. All your teeth are gone, Lao Don replied, shaking his head. And what about my tongue? Is it still there? Chang Tung inquired, sticking out his tongue. Yes, master, your tongue is still there, answered Lao Don. Do you grasp the meaning of this? Chang Tung asked. After pondering for a moment, Lao Don slowly responded, The hard and rigid is gone, leaving only the soft and flexible. Exactly. That's the point, Chang Tung affirmed with joy. Under his teacher's guidance, Lao Don understood that softness and flexibility can overcome hardness and strength, embodying the principle of using the soft to defeat the hard. 20. The Art of Conversation Socrates was known for his habit of wandering into the bustling markets of Athens to engage in stimulating conversations or debates with the public. He had a unique approach to sparking engaging discussions and debates, on one occasion, Socrates, following his routine, entered the market and approached a man with a question. Excuse me, I'm a bit puzzled by something and could use your insight. Everyone says that living a moral life is essential, but what exactly constitutes morality? The man replied, Being honest, loyal, and upright is considered moral. Deceiving and lying, on the other hand, are seen as immoral. Socrates, feigning confusion, asked again, Then why is it that generals on the battlefield constantly devise strategies to deceive their enemies? The man explained 
Deceiving the enemy is a tactical move and is considered just, but deceiving one's own people is immoral. Socrates countered, Imagine our forces are surrounded by the enemy and the general sees the morale of his troops waning. He lies to them, saying, Reinforcements are on their way. Let's courageously move forward. This leads to breaking the siege and winning the battle. Would you consider the general's actions just and moral? The man responded, In dire battlefield situations, such actions might be necessary, but in everyday life, that would be considered immoral. Socrates continued, What if a child refuses to take their medicine and the parents tell them the medicine is very sweet to get them to take it and it cures them? Is that immoral? Reluctantly, the man conceded, In such cases, parents are right to do so, and it cannot be deemed immoral. Dissatisfied, Socrates remarked, Earlier, you said lying is immoral, and now you suggest there are circumstances where lying is moral. It seems we cannot define morality based solely on truthfulness. So, what truly defines morality? Please enlighten me. After a moment of thought, the man said, A person unaware of what morality is cannot act morally. Only with a clear understanding can one truly be moral. Socrates finally felt satisfied with this response, smiling and shaking the man's hand. You truly are a great philosopher. Thanks to you, I now understand what morality is. I've been pondering this question for so long, and I sincerely thank you for clarifying it for me. This story illustrates the art of conversation, where questioning and citing specific examples in different contexts lead to a comprehensive understanding of complex issues. 21. The Fourth Path A father, walking through an orchard with his three children, saw the ripe fruits hanging from the trees and was tempted to steal some. He instructed his children to stand guard at the three paths leading into the orchard. While he was picking the fruits, one child called out, Father, there's still one path left unguarded. The father, puzzled, asked, What do you mean? There are only three paths into this place, the child replied. There's also the path that leads up to heaven. Hearing this, the father felt a wave of shame wash over him. He discarded all the fruits he had picked and hurriedly led his children back home. 22. The Three Travelers Three travelers shared a room in a hotel. The next morning, as they set out, the first took an umbrella, the second carried a walking stick, and the third went without taking anything. Before long, a heavy rain began to fall. By evening, when they returned to the hotel, the one with the umbrella was soaked, the one with the walking stick was covered in bruises, but the third traveler was perfectly fine. Puzzled, the first two asked the third how he managed to stay unharmed without an umbrella or stick. The third traveler first asked the one with the umbrella, Why are you only wet and not hurt? The man with the umbrella replied, When the heavy rain started, I kept going because I had an umbrella, but the wind was so strong that the umbrella couldn't keep me dry, hence I got soaked. In the muddy parts, since I didn't have a stick, I carefully picked solid places to step so I wasn't injured. He then turned to the one with the walking stick. Why are you bruised but not wet? The man with the stick explained, As the rain was coming, I sought shelter because I had no umbrella so I stayed dry. But crossing the muddy road, I used my stick for support, yet I kept falling. The third traveler then revealed, that's why you two ended up wet and bruised while I remained unscathed. When it rained heavily, I sought shelter and carefully navigated the difficult path, staying both dry and uninjured. Your mistake was relying too much on your umbrella and walking stick, making you less cautious. 23. The Fisher King's Son a fisherman known for his exceptional fishing skills was revered as the Fisher King by his peers. 
However, in his old age, he was troubled because his three sons only possessed mediocre fishing abilities. He often shared his woes with others. I can't understand why my fishing skills are so superior, yet my sons are so lacking. I've taught them everything I know. From a young age, I taught them the basics, showing them how to set and cast nets to catch the most fish, how to row the boat to avoid scaring the fish, and the right moments to cast the nets. As they grew, I taught them to understand the tides and fish behaviors, all the knowledge I've accumulated over the years. I've passed on to them without holding back, yet their skills still don't match up to mine. After hearing his story, someone asked, Do you help them every time they cast their nets? Yes, I've been very thorough in teaching them to ensure they acquire the best techniques. And do you accompany them every time they go out to sea? Yes, I always go with them to prevent them from getting lost. The person then pointed out, That might be where you're going wrong. You've only passed on the techniques but haven't allowed them to apply these skills on their own. A person who only knows theory but can't apply it in practice is like someone without experience and therefore can't become proficient. 24. Following in his father's footsteps It's often said that a repeated action becomes a habit, and nurturing a habit eventually shapes one's character. There was a man who had formed a routine of stopping by the local bar for a drink each morning before beginning his day's work. One morning, after saying goodbye to his wife and kids, he set off towards the bar as usual. After walking a bit, he sensed someone was following him. Turning around, he discovered it was his son, eagerly following in his footsteps imprinted in the snow, excitedly saying, Dad, look! I'm walking in your footsteps. This realization struck the father profoundly. He thought to himself, I'm on my way to the bar and here is my son, following in my steps. From that day forward, he never visited the bar again. 25. Scholars and their attire. Once the proud king of Lu said to Zhuangzi, Our state of Lu is brimming with wise scholars. Zhuangzi replied, True scholars are quite rare in Lu. That's not true, the king objected. Everywhere in Lu, you encounter people dressed as scholars. Why claim true scholars are rare? Zhuangzi explained, I've heard that a true scholar wears a rounded cap, symbolizing knowledge of astronomy, square shoes, indicating a deep understanding of geography, and carries a jade pendant with a flaw, showing wisdom and decisiveness. In reality, not all who don scholarly attire are wise, and not all wise men don the attire of scholars. Unconvinced, the king challenged Zhuangzi's assertion, to which Zhuangzi suggested, If you doubt me, issue an edict. Anyone not a scholar yet wearing scholarly attire should be executed. See what happens then. The king immediately issued such an edict, and within less than five days, no one dared to dress as a scholar in Lu. A few days later, a person was found wearing scholarly attire in front of the palace. The king summoned him and discovered he was indeed knowledgeable in astronomy and geography, and had profound insights on national affairs. Zhuangzi told the king, Such is the vastness of Lu, yet true scholars like this man are exceedingly rare. You could say they are few and far between. 26. The Courage of a Thief Tzu Pot was a great general of the Kingdom of So who appreciated individuals with unique skills. Everyone who followed him possessed a distinct talent. One day, a thief approached Tzu Pot, saying, I've heard you value talent. I'm not skilled in ordinary tasks, but I excel at thieving. I wonder if you'd consider my skill valuable. After hearing this, Tzu Pot quickly paid his respects and said, To have someone as skilled as you willing to join forces with me is truly an honor. The officials around him advised against it. Showing courtesy to a thief like this doesn't seem right. 
Tsupat responded, The principle here is something you don't understand. Later, when the Kingdom of Qi launched an attack on So, Tzu Fat led his troops to defend their land, but they were defeated in three battles, with the key forces growing stronger with each encounter. The civil and military officials of So were at their wit's end, unable to devise a strategy. At this moment, the thief came to Tzu Fat and said, I have a small skill that I'd like to offer. Tzu Pat responded, Excellent! Without further ado, he sent the thief on his mission. That night, the thief sneaked into the camp of Qi's commanding general and stole his tent curtain. The next day, Tzu Fat sent someone to return the curtain along with a letter stating, My soldiers found your curtain while gathering firewood. We are returning it to you. The following night, the thief stole the general's pillow and Tzu Fat sent it back. On the third night, the thief stole the general's hairpin, and again Tzu Fat arranged for its return. The key army, hearing of these incidents, became terrified with their generals saying, If we don't withdraw now, the So army might take our heads next. Thus, they ordered a retreat back to Qi. 27. Learning to Let Go once upon a time, two poor woodcutters were gathering wood on a mountain. One day, they stumbled upon two large bags of cotton and joyfully carried them home. Cotton was far more valuable than wood, and selling these two bags could easily cover a month's expenses for their families. As they descended the mountain, each carrying a bag, they hurried home. Partway down, one of them noticed a large bundle of fabric on the road, Upon closer inspection, it was a type of canvas fabric, slightly better and more than a bundle. He was thrilled and proposed to his friend that they leave the cotton bags and take the fabric home instead. His friend refused, arguing that they had already carried the cotton a long way and abandoning it now would waste their previous efforts. He was adamant about not switching. The woodcutter, unable to convince his friend, reluctantly continued on his way alone with the fabric. Further down the road, the one with the fabric saw a light in the forest, and upon approaching, discovered a trove of gold and precious metals, thinking they were finally going to strike it rich. He quickly told his friend to drop the cotton bags and take the treasure instead. Still, his friend was skeptical, suspecting the gold might be fake. He advised against wasting their effort for potentially nothing, preferring to avoid ending up empty-handed. The one who found the gold had no choice but to carry the treasure alone. As they reached the foot of the mountain, a heavy rain began, soaking them through. To their dismay, the cotton bag absorbed the water, becoming too heavy to carry. With no other option, the cotton bag was abandoned and both ended up sharing the load of gold back home. 28. A small task. A person wanted to hang a large painting on the wall in their living room and ask their neighbor for help. Once the painting was temporarily in place, the neighbor suggested, it would look much better in a wooden frame. Agreeing, the homeowner asked the neighbor to find some wood for the frame. Upon finding the wood, as they were about to nail it together, the neighbor remarked, hold on, this piece of wood is a bit long, it needs to be sawed off a bit. So he went to fetch a saw, but after a few strokes, he complained, This won't work. The saw is too blunt. It needs to be sharpened. He then went home to find a file. Soon he realized the file needed a handle for a better grip. He ventured into the bushes to find a suitable branch to use as a handle, deciding to chop it down. But to chop the branch, he first needed to sharpen his axe. And to sharpen the axe, he needed to properly secure the sharpening stone, which meant constructing a stand to hold the stone in place. To build the stand, he needed a carpenter's bench, but lacking a complete set of carpentry tools, he couldn't build it. So he went into the village to borrow the necessary tools, but this time he didn't return. Of course, the homeowner had to hang the painting by themselves. 
In the evening, they saw their neighbor helping a carpenter carry a bulky electric saw from the store. We all encounter many crossroads in life, but some people get lost in their own mazes. These individuals always seem busy, yet they themselves don't know what they're busy with. 29. The Magic of Life A wealthy young man was deeply in love with a lady of high society who was not only beautiful but also fashionable and lived a life of luxury. He adored her and always did as she wished, immediately fulfilling any desire she expressed. On the day before their engagement, he asked her, What gift would you like for our engagement? She honestly replied, I want a diamond ring. So he bought her an expensive diamond ring as a gift. Another young man from a humble background loved a girl who was of average beauty, but known for her hard work and frugality. The day before their engagement, he asked, What would you like me to give you as an engagement present? She said, A simple crystal ring would be enough for me. Thus, he spent a few dollars on a crystal ring for her, which made her very happy. Twenty years later, the first couple had almost depleted their wealth, living in dire straits, and even had to sell the precious diamond ring. Now, the woman wore a crystal ring on her finger. The second couple, however, had improved their lives significantly through diligence and savings, becoming wealthy. The once simple glass ring was now replaced with a diamond one, and they enjoyed a fulfilling and happy life. Life like magic, changes everything over 20 years. But the actions we take today can indicate the transformations we'll see in the future. It has the power to turn crystal into diamond and diamond back into crystal. 30. The Merchant and the Old Fisherman A merchant noticed an old fisherman sitting at the bow of a boat, calmly fishing. Every time the fisherman caught a fish, he would remove it from the hook and then gently release it back into the water. Curious, the merchant asked, Why do you release the fish instead of taking them home? The old man inquired in return, What would I do with them at home? Take them home to eat, the merchant replied. I only need three fish a day to eat, no more than that, the old man explained. Then you could sell them at the market, the merchant suggested. Sell them? Why would I need to sell these few fish? The fisherman asked, puzzled. By selling them, you could make some money, the merchant answered. And what would I need that money for? The fisherman questioned again. You could use it to buy a boat, the merchant said, finding the whole conversation baffling. And what would I need a boat for? The fisherman remained calm. With a boat, you could comfortably sit and fish at your leisure the merchant said enthusiastically. So, in your opinion, am I not comfortable right now? The fisherman asked. The merchant was at a loss for words. Sometimes, only you can know whether you're truly content. Material wealth and status are just for show to others and may not truly satisfy one's own needs. 31. Dad over time, the image of a father in his son's eyes changes gradually. At seven, dad is amazing. He knows everything. At 14, it seems like he's not always right. At 20, dad seems a bit outdated. His thinking doesn't match the times. At 25, the old man doesn't know anything, always asking questions so behind the times. At 35, if dad had been as talented as I am now back then, he would certainly be a wealthy man today. At 45, I wonder if I should discuss this with the old man. Maybe he'll have some good advice. At 55, it's such a pity dad's gone. Honestly, his views were very insightful. At 60, poor dad, he truly was a learned scholar who knew everything. It's just a shame I realized his worth too late. 32. The monkey. An elderly sage with an air of mystery wandered into a small village at the foot of the Himalayas, declaring to all the villagers that he knew a magical spell to turn stones into gold. However, he emphasized that nothing in this world comes for free. 
He stated that anyone who wished to learn this spell must first offer the most valuable item in their home as tuition. The villagers, who had always been poor and dreamed of wealth, gathered to discuss the matter. They concluded that sacrificing a bit in the form of tuition was a small price to pay for such powerful knowledge. So they pooled their resources to pay the old man, eagerly gathering around him to learn the miraculous spell. With a dramatic gulp, the old man muttered an elaborate incantation and transformed a stone in a wooden barrel into a shimmering piece of gold. Teach us now, they all demanded. The old man did not hesitate to share the spell with them, patiently teaching until even the simplest villager could recite it by heart. Pleased, he revealed that they could start using the spell at dawn the next day. He assured everyone they could turn worthless stones into glittering gold with one crucial condition. While casting the spell, they must not think of the Himalayan monkey. Absolutely not, the villagers repeated in confusion. What did gold have to do with Himalayan monkeys? They thought the old man's warning was pointless. Why would they even think about the monkey? Yet, as centuries passed, it's said that if you visit this village today, you'll find many people placing stones in wooden barrels, muttering the spell and striving not to think of the Himalayan monkey. They never managed to produce gold, but no one blamed the old man for deceiving them. Each person admitted that the more they tried not to think of the monkey, the more it consumed their thoughts. 33. Cockfighting Training There was a person exceptionally skilled at training fighting cocks. The king invited him to the palace to train his cocks. Ten days later, the king inquired, Are the cocks well trained now? The man replied, Not yet. This cock only uses its crow to intimidate the other. After another ten days, the king asked again, Is that cock ready to fight now? The man said, Not yet. It gets too excited, and as soon as it hears another cock crow, it rushes to battle. A month went by, and the king inquired, Is it ready now? The man replied, Still no, it just glares at the other. Then, after another ten days, the king asked him, Is the cock good now? This time, it's ready. The cockfight trainer said, Now, when it hears another cock, it remains unflinching like a wooden cock. It wins confidently, and the other cocks just run away at the sight of it, not daring to fight. 34. Differing Perspectives a guest introduced a friend to a highly renowned official. After the friend left, the official told the guest, Your friend has three unfavorable qualities. He laughed upon seeing me, which shows he is careless. He didn't mention his teacher while talking, which is a betrayal to his mentor. And it's inappropriate not to engage in conversation when meeting for the first time, indicating a lack of manners. The guest smiled and responded. He laughed upon seeing you because he is friendly and approachable. He didn't mention his teacher because he is independent and not factional. And he didn't engage in conversation at first meeting because he is straightforward and honest with everyone. 35. Be wary of trusting too easily. Once upon a time, there was a nomad who would lead his flock of goats to the grasslands every day, happily watching them graze. One evening, a thief sneaked in with the intent to steal some goats. However, upon noticing the nomad's vigilance and his inability to sleep, always on high alert to protect his flock, the thief felt disheartened and ended up spending the whole night just talking to him, without daring to steal anything. But the thief, cunning and full of tricks, killed a tiger and skinned it, placing its hide among the grass with only the tiger's head visible. After setting his trap, he approached the nomad and claimed, My friend, you are in luck. The tiger has sent me to ask for a goat to have for its dinner. Suspicious, the nomad asked, Where is this tiger? Looking towards where the thief pointed, 
he indeed saw the tiger's head peeking through the grass from a distance. Shocked, he told the thief, My friend, take whichever goat you need. I won't stop you. Thus, the thief took a goat. Seeing the nomad's fear upon spotting the tiger, the thief's greed was ignited. So, he returned daily, claiming the tiger wished to eat a goat. Gradually, the thief managed to take half of the nomad's flock. 36. The Quest for the Perfect Woman There was a man who lived his entire life as a bachelor because he was always in search of the perfect woman. By the time he reached 70, someone asked him, You've traveled everywhere, from Kabul to Kathmandu, from Kathmandu to Goa, from Goa to Punaka, traversing so many places. Haven't you found the perfect woman yet? The elderly man, with a touch of sadness, replied, Yes, there was a time when I met a woman who seemed perfect. Curious, the person inquired. So what happened? Why didn't you marry her? With a sorrowful tone, the old man said, How could I? She was looking for the perfect man. 37. Footprints in the Mud When Jiam Chan first became a monk, the abbot, recognizing his intelligence and diligence, paradoxically assigned him to the most disliked job in the monastery, the begging monk, who braves the weather and societal scorn daily. Jiam Chan was frustrated by the disrespect he encountered. One night, unable to sleep, Jiam Chan was found by the abbot surrounded by a pile of worn-out straw sandals. When questioned, Jiam Chan lamented about the rapid wear of his shoes and wondered if he should conserve more for the monastery's sake. Understanding his plight, the abbot took him outside after a heavy rain to the muddy path in front of the monastery. He asked Jiam Chan if he desired to be an ordinary monk or a distinguished scholar of Buddhist teachings. Jiam Chan expressed his wish to be renowned but felt his current status as a begging monk belittled by others hindered that goal. The abbot pointed out the muddy path, asking if Jiam Chan could find his footprints from the day before, which he couldn't. But now, in the mud, their footprints were clearly visible. The abbot explained that it's through adversity and hardships like the muddy path that one leaves a lasting mark. The unchallenged life, like a smooth and hard road, leaves no trace. Ashamed, Jum Chan realized the value of his trials. His determined steps on the monastery's muddy path would leave a legacy across the land, proving that it's through life's struggles that one truly makes a mark. 38. David's Opportunity David Swan was walking along the main road toward Boston. His father, a merchant in Boston, wanted him to work in his store. Early in the morning, David set out, and after a long journey, he grew tired and thought of resting in the shade if he found any along the way. Soon, he came across a stream. The area was serene and cool. He sat down, took a sip of water, used his knapsack and some books as a pillow, and laid down on the soft grass, quickly falling into a deep sleep. While he was sleeping, a beautiful carriage pulled by two fine horses came by. Suddenly, one of the horses stumbled, forcing the carriage to stop by the stream. An elderly wealthy couple stepped out and noticed David sleeping. He's sleeping so soundly, breathing evenly. If only I could sleep like that, what a joy it would be, the wealthy man remarked. His wife exclaimed, With our old age, it seems impossible to enjoy such deep sleep. Look at the boy sleeping just like our son would. Should we wake him up? Oh, we don't know anything about him. But he looks so innocent. David was unaware that fortune was standing right beside him. This elderly couple was extremely wealthy and had recently lost their only son. In such situations, people often do peculiar things like adopting a child and making them their heir. But David remained asleep, undisturbed. Let's wake him up, the wealthy wife insisted again. Just then, 
the carriage driver called out. It's time to go. The horse is fine now. Reluctantly, the couple took one last look and quickly got back into their carriage. Five minutes later, a beautiful young woman strolled by the stream, stopped to drink some water, and noticed David. She felt as if she had intruded into someone's bedroom without permission, so she quickly left. Suddenly, she saw a large wasp hovering over David's head and instinctively used her scarf to shoo it away. Looking at David, she trembled and murmured, He's so handsome. But David remained still, and she left, dissatisfied. Had David awakened, he might have noticed her presence and possibly made a connection. Her father owned a large department store. Just as she left, two robbers with hats pulled down over their eyes crept by. They saw David sleeping by the stream and were tempted by evil thoughts. He might have some money on him. Let's check, and if he wakes up, we'll deal with him. One of them pulled out a gleaming dagger. Just as they were about to act, a dog suddenly appeared to drink from the stream, startling them. Wait, its owner might be nearby. We better be careful and leave quickly. The thieves vanished as quickly as they appeared. The clattering of a carriage woke David. He jumped up and quickly disappeared into the dust. David never knew that, while he slept, many events unfolded around him, including both fortune and danger. But then again, how many of us are truly aware of such things in the world? 39. The Python and the Leopard In a certain forest there was a large python and a leopard both eyeing a gazelle. The leopard watched the python, and the python watched the leopard, each secretly plotting their next move. The leopard thought, If I want to eat the gazelle, I must first eliminate the python. Similarly, the python considered, To get the gazelle, I must first deal with the leopard. Thus, the leopard and the python attacked each other. The leopard bit the python's neck, thinking, If I don't kill it, it will strangle me. The python wrapped itself around the leopard, thinking, If I don't suffocate it, it will eat me. As a result, both exerted their utmost effort. In the end, the gazelle casually strolled away, while the leopard and the python lay defeated on the ground. A hunter who witnessed the battle commented, If both had simultaneously focused on the prey and then calmly shared it, neither would have died. If both had decided to leave, abandoning the prey, neither would have died. If one had left, allowing the other to hunt, both would have lived. If both had realized the gravity of their situation, neither would have had to die. Their demise was due to a lack of humility, turning a hunt into a fatal struggle for survival. 40. The Robert Rosenthal Effect American psychologist Robert Rosenthal conducted a fascinating experiment with mice at Harvard University as follows. Initially, he divided the experimental mice into two groups. He assigned Group A to one team of researchers and told them, You're in luck. These mice have been carefully selected. They are very intelligent, perfect for circus training. Then, he assigned the other group to a different research team telling them, Unfortunately, these mice are just average, not very bright, so please use the most basic methods to train them. Following these instructions, the two lab teams proceeded with their training. After some time, Rosenthal had both groups conduct an experiment where the mice had to find their way out of a maze. For mice, navigating through tunnels to find food is natural. However, this journey had many dead ends, requiring them to remember their paths, and only the intelligent mice could successfully escape the maze. The results of the test showed that the mice from Group A were significantly smarter than those from Group B, quickly finding their way out of the maze. Upon concluding the experiment, Rosenthal revealed to the lab teams that he had randomly chosen the mice without any selection, and in reality, he had no idea which mice were more intelligent than others. 
He had simply told Group A that their mice were very smart and Group B that theirs were just average. Because the Group A team believed their mice were intelligent, they employed special training methods. As a result, the mice in this group indeed became smarter. Conversely, the Group B mice were considered average and trained with only basic methods, leading to them not being as smart. 41. The Expensive Peacock Painting A certain king had heard of an artist with a talent for creating beautiful oil paintings and decided to visit this artist. I would like you to paint me a picture of a peacock, the king requested. A year later, the king returned to visit the artist. Where is the painting I ordered? I had asked you to paint a peacock for me. Your peacock will be ready shortly, said the artist. He then took out a piece of paper and quickly painted a very beautiful peacock. The king was very pleased, but was surprised by the price. It only took a short time and not much effort to paint this picture. The work seems so light and easy. Why is the price so high? The king asked. The artist then took the king on a tour around his house, showing him room after room filled with piles of peacock paintings. The artist explained, this price is entirely reasonable. You see, even though it now only takes a little effort, I have spent countless hours and a whole year preparing to paint this peacock for you. 42. Serenity During a sweltering day, the grass in the Zen garden had all dried up. We should pull out this unsightly dead grass, a young monk suggested. Let's wait for cooler weather. The master casually replied, Go with the flow. By mid-autumn, the master bought a bag of grass seeds, which the young monk scattered. Suddenly, an autumn breeze scattered the seeds. The wind has blown away many seeds, the young monk exclaimed. It's fine. The seeds carried away by the wind were the weak ones. They wouldn't have sprouted anyway, the master said. Let it be. After sowing, some birds came pecking at the seeds. What a waste! The remaining seeds were eaten by birds! The young monk stamped his foot in frustration. No worries, there are plenty of seeds. They can't eat them all, the master continued reading his scriptures. Let it happen. At midnight, clouds gathered and a heavy rain poured. Early in the morning, the young monk rushed into the meditation hall. Master! This time it's really ruined. All the seeds have been washed away by the rain. Wherever they flowed, they will sprout, the master said, still in meditation, eyes closed. Let it unfold. More than a fortnight later, the previously barren courtyard was lush with young sprouts, even in areas where seeds hadn't been deliberately sown. The young monk clapped in joy. The master nodded. Let there be joy. This old monk seemed to remain calm in the face of all situations, deeply understanding the profound meaning of life's principles. Why do our hearts get disturbed by external factors, leading to anxiety, fear, or even despair? Is it because achievements and victories cloud our judgment? 43. Blooming Wilderness before Van San Temple, there was a barren wasteland where nothing could grow. To everyone before Master Tam Min, this piece of land was insignificant, believed to be of no value, and no one thought it could ever become a beautiful garden. Master Tom Min, blind in both eyes, refused to let the wasteland remain barren. After becoming a monk, while others focused on their scriptures and aspired to high ranks, he took up a hoe to cultivate the land. With every strike and seed planted, day by day, whenever he had free time, he tirelessly worked on this barren land. To those who could see, his actions seemed foolish. Yet, as others mocked and scoffed at his endeavor, the seeds Master Tam Minch planted began to sprout and grow, one by one. One spring night, all the buds blossomed, and the monks from the temple came out to see. They were greeted by a sight of beautiful, vibrant flowers, leaving everyone in awe. Only Master Tom Min remained calm, 
Being blind, no matter how beautiful the flowers were, he could not see them. His transformation of the wasteland into a flower garden was meant for others to enjoy, to show that, in the eyes of a blind man, there truly is no wasteland. 44. A young boy lived in a large house at the foot of a mountain. He loved climbing trees, swimming, playing soccer, and admired beautiful girls. He led a happy life. One day, he spoke to God, saying, I've thought about it for a long time, and I know what I want to be when I grow up. What will you do? God asked. I want to live in a big house with a hallway in front, two St. Bernard statues at the entrance, and a flower garden in the back. I want to marry a tall and beautiful girl with a gentle nature, long, shiny black hair, blue eyes who can play the guitar, and has a voice as clear as a bird's song. We will have three strong sons and play soccer together. As they grow up, one will become a scientist, another a politician, and the youngest will play as a forward in a rugby team. I want to be a maritime explorer, climb mountains, help people, and own a red Ferrari without ever having to carry anyone in it. That is indeed a beautiful dream, God said. I hope your dream comes true. Later on, he suffered a knee injury while playing soccer, which meant he could no longer climb mountains or trees, much less sail the seas. Thus, he pursued a degree in business management and later ventured into the medical equipment business. He married a beautiful woman with long black hair, though she was not tall, and her eyes were brown, not blue. She did not know how to play the guitar or even sing, but she was an excellent cook and painted like a renowned artist. Thanks to his hard work, he lived in a high-rise building in the city center from which he could see the sea and the sparkling lights. There were no St. Bernard statues at his door. He had three lovely daughters, the youngest of whom, lying in a stroller, was the most adorable. All three daughters loved their parents deeply. Although they could not play soccer with him, they would sometimes go to the park to play on the spaceship together, where his daughter would sit under a tree, playing the guitar and singing softly. He had a happy, fulfilled life, but didn't own a red Ferrari. Sometimes, he did not even think about how to increase the sales of his products. One morning, upon waking up, he suddenly remembered his childhood dream. I am sad he said repeatedly to those around him, saddened that his dream had not come true. In the darkness, he lay thinking for a long time, finally deciding to have a new dream, which was what he already had. After that, he recovered from his illness, lived happily in his home, listening to the sweet voices of his children, looking into his wife's brown eyes. In the evenings, he would look out at the sea, letting go of his old dreams. Young people, in truth, we all have joys in life, which is the present moment. Optimistic people see this as a blessing from God, living with gratitude for the present, while pessimistic people lose the joy they hold in their hands. We all have the present, so what reason do we have not to enjoy the joy that comes with it? 45. Bird Keeping in the kingdom of Lu, there existed a unique seabird, the likes of which no one had ever seen before, leading many to believe it was a divine creature. The king ordered his men to capture this bird and bring it back to the palace, where it was treated as an honored guest. However, the bird seemed distressed and unhappy. The king, deeply concerned, pondered, How can we cheer up this little bird? Suddenly, he had an idea. He decided to invite a group of musicians to play music for the bird and instructed his chefs to prepare a variety of delicious dishes for it. Unfortunately, these well-intentioned gestures only frightened the bird further. It refused to eat or drink, becoming increasingly anxious and flapping its wings in distress. After two days of this treatment, the bird was so terrified it nearly died. 46. The Eagle and the Chicken in the Native American tribes of the United States, there exists a tale as follows. Long ago, atop a towering mountain, nestled an eagle's nest on its slope, housing four large eggs. 
An earthquake shook the mountain, causing one of the eagle eggs to tumble down and land in a chicken coop at the mountain's base. A hen volunteered to incubate the large egg. One day the egg hatched into a beautiful eagle chick. Unfortunately, the little bird was raised and grew up believing it was a chicken. From its youth to adulthood, the eagle did everything real chickens did, scratching the earth for worms and insects, clucking and even managing to flap its wings and take short flights. Before long, the eagle convinced itself it was nothing more than another chicken. Despite loving its family and home, the eagle's soul yearned for something greater. Then, one day, while playing in the yard, the eagle looked up and saw majestic eagles soaring high in the sky. If only I could fly like those birds, it wished. The chickens laughed loudly. You can't soar like those birds. You're a chicken, and chickens can't fly. The eagle continued to gaze at its true kin, dreaming of flying high with them. Each time it expressed this wish, the chickens would say it was impossible. Eventually, the eagle believed this to be true, abandoning its dreams to live as a chicken. In the end, the eagle died. The greatest regret of the eagle's life was its failure to explore its true potential. It never dared to pursue its dreams, never attempted to learn to fly, and thus never soared into the blue sky like its ancestors before it. 47. Believe in Yourself the ancient Greek philosopher Socrates is renowned for many sayings, but one of his most famous quotes, known by people of all ages, is, Believe in yourself. But where did this saying originate? Here's the story. In his final years, aware that his time was limited, Socrates devised daily challenges for his students. One day, he summoned a student to his bedside and said, My candle is nearly burnt out. Fetch another and attach it here. Do you grasp my meaning? Clearly, the student replied, your wisdom and knowledge will be passed down through the ages. But, Socrates slowly added, I seek the most intelligent successor, someone not only with exceptional intellect, but also filled with confidence and extraordinary courage. Yet, I haven't found such a person. Could you find one for me? Yes, master the student said, I will spare no effort in searching to honor your trust and teachings. Socrates smiled silently. The sincere and hard-working student, undeterred by difficulties, searched far and wide. However, all the candidates he brought back were tactfully rejected by Socrates. Upon returning from a long journey, the student approached Socrates' deathbed. Seeing his student, Socrates, gravely ill, took his hand, asked him to sit, and gently said, You've endured much, but none surpass you. I'll try harder, the student earnestly replied. From cities to villages, I'll search the world over to find and present to you the most outstanding individual. Socrates merely smiled in response. Half a year later, with Socrates on the brink of death and the most outstanding individual still undiscovered, the student sat by his bed, ashamed and tearful, blaming himself for disappointing his teacher. I am the disappointed one, but you should apologize to yourself, Socrates said with a hint of disappointment, closing his eyes for a long moment before kindly adding, the most outstanding individual was always you. Your lack of self-confidence prevented you from seeing it, causing you to miss the opportunity. With those words, the great philosopher passed away, leaving behind a timeless lesson. Everyone has the potential to be outstanding. The key is to have confidence in oneself and to always be willing to stand up and recognize one's own value. 48. Life is like climbing a mountain. A young man passionate about mountain climbing sought advice from a renowned climbing expert on the best techniques for scaling mountains. One particular question he had was, what should we do if it starts raining while we're halfway up the mountain? The expert climber responded, you should continue to the summit. Why head to the summit? Isn't the weather worse up there? The young man asked skeptically. 
Heading to the summit, of course, means facing heavier rain, but it's not life-threatening. Descending, the rain might be lighter, but the risk of landslides is higher, and you could be buried. The climbing expert earnestly added, when it comes to storms, avoiding them might get you swept away. Facing them, on the other hand, could ensure your survival. 49. Suspecting the wrong thief. A person lost their axe and started suspecting the neighbor's son of stealing it. Consequently, he kept a watchful eye on the young man, observing his movements on the street that seemed suspiciously like those of someone who had stolen his axe, thinking to himself, walking without making a sound, he must be quite skilled. Then, one day he heard the young man talking to someone else and thought, his voice is barely audible, as if he's afraid of being overheard. How cunning. He convinced himself that the young man's walk and the sound of his voice, indeed his entire demeanor from head to toe, every move he made was exactly like that of a thief. Later, he found the axe he had lost. It turned out that he had dropped it into a ravine while chopping wood on the mountain. The next day, when he saw the neighbor's son again, he felt that his walk was just like any other person's. His speech was normal, not at all like that of a thief. 50. Beauty and Ugliness A teacher and his students were traveling and decided to rest for the night at a roadside inn. The innkeeper had two wives, one strikingly beautiful and the other quite plain. This led to a debate among the students about whom the innkeeper loved more. Some argued that he must adore his beautiful wife, while others believed he loved neither. Curious, they approached the innkeeper for an answer. He said, I love my plain wife and dislike the beautiful one. This response puzzled everyone, leading them to wonder why he would prefer the plain wife over the beautiful one. Before they could question the innkeeper further, their teacher intervened, explaining, The innkeeper loves beauty. The beautiful wife, always aware of her looks, dresses extravagantly, turning her vanity into ugliness, while the plain wife, lacking in physical beauty, possesses inner beauty. Which, my students, is more beautiful, the outer appearance or the beauty within? The teacher implied that the beautiful wife's arrogance made her unattractive. How could vanity ever be considered beautiful? The plain wife, aware of her lack of physical beauty, remained humble, and that humility was her true beauty.